Mayoral candidates in the River City in full view in the final weeks before election. We're looking at the campaigns and what's left to prove for both Donna Deegan and Daniel Davis. Lawmakers in the state's leader in Tallahassee pushing through a dizzying number of bills. We'll give a review of the most recent legislation and what's yet to come before the end of session. Plus, courts in crisis. There's a judicial emergency in the view of our guest. Chris Hand joins us on This Week in Jacksonville. And good morning to you. Yeah, Chris Hand joining us once a month for a show that we call Hand on Government. Leans into your expertise, uh, a career in government and a government law attorney. So we're going to start with a halftime report, if you will, on the mayoral campaign between Donna Deegan and Daniel Davis. Here we go. I mean, we're just a few weeks away from Election Day, really, which is May 16th and early voting starts and mail-in voting. All of that is underway soon. Well, Kent, that's a very apt analogy you use because that's exactly where we are at this point. Uh, we're halfway through the second election. As you remember, the first election was on March 21st. The second election is on May 16th. So we're about halfway into that. Uh, and the score is tied. There have been two polls in the last 10 days or so, uh, one of which showed Donna Deegan's campaign at a poll which showed her slightly ahead, a UNF poll which essentially showed the race tied, her up by one point. So it's obviously a very close contest at this point. And the campaigns will spend the next month doing a couple of things, trying to persuade those remaining undecided voters, particularly no party affiliation or NPA voters, which are often key uh, and decisive in these contests, and also trying to turn out their voters. In Donna Deegan's case, trying to make sure Democrats get to the polls. In Daniel Davis's case, trying to make sure Republicans get to the polls. And of course, there's an even bigger reason for that. As we recall, in the May 21st election, one of the biggest pieces of news is not what did happen, yeah. but what didn't happen. 75% yeah. of registered voters did not show up for that election, only a 25% turnout. So just for the good of the community in general, there will be an effort to turn out voters, right. uh, both campaigns, to make sure they have some sort of turnout advantage. Supervisor of elections in Duval County, Mike Hogan, said it on election night, really disappointed with the number of people who chose, I'm not participating in this. So how does that change? Does it change just by matter of, hey, a little higher profile because there's only two candidates at the top of the race? Uh, is it the ground game of all these campaigns? How does that turnout figure change? The answer is all of the above, Kent. I think the fact that it is down to two mayoral candidates is very clarifying at that point. There's a clear choice between these two candidates. And so I think there often is some heightened voter interest when it is down to those last two people. And when we close the night on May the 16th, we will have a mayor elect here in Jacksonville. So the gravity of the election uh, becomes even greater. And I think that powers turnout. But at the end of the day, the greatest turnout engine is the campaigns themselves. They have obviously are very motivated to make sure their voters, their supporters get to the polls. And so you'll see very active efforts on that by both campaigns. Both campaigns are already doing a lot of canvassing, door-to-door -door knocking. There are probably paid efforts going on as well to try and help increase voter turnout. So at the end of the day, it's the candidates and their campaigns which are going to be the biggest motivation to try and get people out to the polls. Our role here at Channel 4, of course, uh, we're not trying to influence or sway an election. We're trying to report on it. So one of the things that we've changed over the years is in terms of how we report on polling. But when you look at polling, and one of the reasons that we do that is because I can pay for a poll and, it, boy, my numbers might seem really good. So how do you interpret? You mentioned a couple of different polls. Uh, one poll may have uh, Davis ahead. One poll may have Deegan ahead. How do you look at those things and then maybe determine what's the real trend behind that? Well, I think, Kent, you have to kind of take a look at these polls and understand what the methodology is. Who have they polled? Have they gotten a representative sample of the electorate? Have the polls done a good job of figuring out what is that final electorate going to look like? And have they actually talked to voters who are really going to go out and vote or people who've just said they're going to go out and vote? To me, an even better measure of how an election is going is tracking that turnout going forward. Remember, there are three ways we can vote in this election. One is we can vote by mail. And by the way, a reminder that under Florida law now, you have to request a mail ballot every year now. So if someone wants to vote by mail and they haven't received a ballot yet, they have to request that from the supervisor of elections. Early voting will be between May the 1st and May the 14th. Or, of course, people can vote on Election Day itself, May the 16th. It's that turnout which I think provides the best quantitative data to seeing how an election is going. Looking at that turnout, 
voters of which party are coming out, how many Democrats, how many Republicans, how many MPAs. I think that provides the best tracking to help forecast where an election might go. Yeah, so before we move away from the mayoral campaign, we talked about it in that first election, so divisive, so many negative ads, and we kind of expected that that would be the case here in this runoff time. Uh, someone even mentioned to me this week, it looks like Donna Deegan is actually running against Daniel Davis and the sheriff, because the sheriff uh, now is in an ad uh, basically attacking the Democratic candidate. It, this seems un really unusual to me. Well, I think it's reflective of the fact that in some of that polling we were just discussing, Kent, it shows that crime overwhelmingly is the issue of greatest concern for voters. And, you know, from the beginning, the Davis campaign has been leaning strongly into the crime issue. Look, in some ways, there are not that many differences between the two candidates. Both Daniel Davis and Donna Deegan have said that they want to increase the number of police officers on the street going forward. So on some issues related to crime, there's not a lot of daylight between the two of them. But I think some of these efforts you're seeing are very reflective of the fact that crime remains a potent issue, something that voters care about. And of course, we are still dealing with a chronic crime challenge here in the city of Jacksonville that's been going on now for close to a couple of decades. Various administrations and city councils and sheriffs have tried to deal with it, but it still persists to some extent. One of the reasons it's a potent issue in the mind of voters, and while you're seeing a lot of discussion about it during this campaign. So there are some other contests on the ballot. Let's talk about this. Property appraiser, and then the city council districts, 2, 7, 8, 9, 11, 14, and then we got this at-large 5. So other things on the ballot, how do you coach people or advise people on, hey, what they should be looking for when it comes to this vote coming up? Well, all these races are very impactful. It's very easy in our system where we have a strong mayor and a consolidated form of government for people to kind of look at the mayor's race and then maybe not pay quite as much attention to some of these other races, but they're very impactful. Obviously, the property appraiser, among other responsibilities, yeah. each year sets the property value of our homes and business properties, which obviously has an impact on the amount of taxes we pay. So that's just one of many responsibilities. And the city council is hugely impactful. It's a co-equal branch of government. The late mayor, Jake Godbold, used to say, a mayor can't do anything without 10 votes. Uh, and that's exactly right. You have to get 10 votes, a majority of the city council to move forward. So their role is crucial. They also each year are responsible for adopting the more than $1.5 billion city budget, setting the millage rate or the property tax rate. So these are races that also have a huge impact on people's lives. And particularly in the case of city council races, we should remember that in our consolidated form of government, every citizen has six council members who are directly accountable to them. <clears throat> Their district council person, and the five at-large council members who represent everyone in the community. So city council is often the place where people of Jacksonville can use their effective citizenship skills, engage with government, share their hopes and concerns, and try and move government in their direction. Very impactful races that I think voters would be well advised to pay very close attention to as we move forward. All right, so to help you with that, if you need a little help figuring out who to vote for, don't worry. You head right now to news4jacks.com slash voters guide. Do this at your leisure, but we've got a complete breakdown of the candidates in every race on the ballot. All right, so don't go anywhere. When we come back, we're shifting to the state capitol. We're headed to the final two weeks of Florida's legislative session, and that's next on This Week in Jacksonville.